Good afternoon. Uh, this session uh, deals with building language resources on page 46 of the English program. Uh, we will have six presentations, five in the room and one will be uh, broadcast through internet because Mr. David Bradley is in Australia. Uh, we have 120 minutes, so uh, we are going to share the time. So uh, each uh, presentation will have 15 minutes, uh, but uh, 10 minutes I will give a yellow card, and 15 minutes I will give the red card. Huh? And also to organize the session, uh, at the end of each presentation, we give the floor to raise questions, but reply will be done at the end, collectively, okay? Uh, comments also. Uh, so, uh, to begin with, uh, we have a presentation uh, on are internets under sites chic, a brief history of Languages on the Internet through Unicode, avec Chantal Lebrouin, President, Eurolink Association in Britain, France, and Louis Cousin, Chief Executive Officer, uh, Open Root Company in Paris, France. The floor is yours. Hmm? Uh, French 
show them the chess fights they talk about. <coughs> Come fish in the How do you make that? You make money system that doesn't have it. Well, they started by having, a, of course, creating CCTV, but so often there was no space available in the code, in the code table of the computer or the, of the equipment for printing. So they uh, started at adding some uh, little gadgets to make the seat from a satellite. Which is an additional non printing character, but it's printing, but not at the same time as the seat. So it prints first the satellite and then the seat. And many characters were created that way. <coughs> Now, this has been going on uh, since 1993 using a standard that will have been defined by the ISO, ISO is an action, it's an international organization uh, which creates, have been creating over the past a lot of standards for computing systems, for computing operational methods. And there was this um, special the idea was that every character would have a code. No two, items, no two characters would have the same code in the They are not identical. So that was, in a way, sort of guarantee that if you create a document, you can make sure that all characters have the special code they need to be printed or to be presented. Of course, that's a theory. But if the equipment that uh, visualize the, the character, he's not equipped to create that character and so on, then he doesn't work. And then he gets different uh, blah blah or something, squares or one things which represent the, the missing character. A special case, for example, is the Vietnamese alphabet. Um, he, he was using several subsets, because Unicode was accepting uh, blocks of the uh, symbols which were not included in a single alphabet. So they picked uh, symbols in different places and make them into a, a Vietnamese subset. Uh, for example, it's got six subsets which are, a, let's say, the borrowed, borrowed symbols which were already defined for that basic thing like Latin. Supplement for Latin, expanded GN for Latin, additional extension for Latin, that means you see the difference with the, the basic standards. And that was to create the DOM, the DOM, I'm not sure that's pronunciation for the means, but it's a money symbol, a dollar. It's not as big as all of course. It's not uh, of people who write document and who want to be extremely uh, to in presenting the, the, the typing of the organization has to make sure they use the, not only the pre-appropriate standard, but the appropriate extensions and make sure that supposedly extended character set exists. But if they don't, you have to invent your own way of making an extension. So that's what is uh, easy way in our <coughs> So Unicorn is not a, is not physically a font. You know, it is not defined in terms of the dimension, in terms of curves, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the thickness of the, the, of the coin. It's just a, a representation, a, a model representation of the character, which can be modified in a number of ways if it turn into a real symbol or to something that's visible. And if you don't have that, then you have to uh, shop, go shopping into the, the maze of the input uh, symbols to find something that's reasonably similar to what you want to print. And uh, that's it's a business, and it's a business, it's also a market for fonts. And there are thousands of fonts at the moment because not only there are fonts created by the major equipment manufacturers, but also by amateurs, well, not so not so stupid amateurs of course, uh, who know how
moment you may call it is being created by American on the lake. American on the lake and uh like on the lake and they've been created by open people who are joining each other, making emojis. Perhaps we to get some of the strategies for that. And uh, waiting uh, for the next emoji to play. And sometimes it may take several months and a year perhaps. That's a uh, in the, in the consortium, we have what was created in July uh, 2017, at least two years ago. Uh, we had a lot 
out of new DVDs with new characters, with little ones, if you can see that, where uh, actually on any which is. I think there was a, the collection in terms of real characters was made out of. At the moment, we have taken another example of the kangaroos, for example. There are a number of images, number of images for kangaroos. They all mean kangaroo. But each manufacturer has its own kangaroo. Apple, uh, Google, and Microsoft, uh, Samsung, and so on. And of course, there would be more. If there are already um, six, that means uh, next year there will be 10, and the year after there will be 52, and so on. Yeah. And then you have uh, some uh, special characters which are not frequently used. For example, uh, a Mongolian letter, which like a six, uh, a six um, character, and this sort of city letter. But there are many languages which have, cons which have constructions of similar to that. So that's easy to code in a, in, a, in, a, in a code, because uh, Books are there, but then uh, translating that into real equipment and real users who can use that. Is Next. Yeah. Now, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Louis Cousin and Chantal Dumont. Now, um, I would uh, invite you to make questions to our speakers on this very basic topic for multilingualism, which is Unicode standards. Any question or comments? Yeah. Well, I would say I would like to make some comments, not questions. Uh, Unicode, as the idea is that the uh, uh, character which is uh, has an accent on it, which is already used, uh, have one code, like the A accent in French. Um, but when you have the open O with accent, Unicode tell you you have to have a code for the open O, another code for the accent, and a third code to tell the police to, to, to put them together. And uh, the result is not always beautiful. And several times I discussed with the Unicode I uh, don't all that. The, the people who are in charge of running Unicode or deciding about how to extend Unicode, uh, they say that, okay, they, they, they don't do no new coding of characters anymore. And this is a penalizing for other uh, languages uh, who would like to have their characters also uh, included uh, in one code only. Uh, but now I, I discovered they, 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 are, they prefer playing with the figures of kangaroos and other things instead of adding uh, new characters which are used for my people. So I think that's really unfair. And that's why uh, I, I do agree with uh, uh, <coughs> the speaker when he says the Unicode is made by white people and by Americans only. And, and they don't care about other, uh, other people in the world. I'm very sorry for that. Although you call it the only best solution we can adopt if one of the organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. I think that maybe this is inspiration for a recommendation in the document. Any other question? Uh, no questions. So in that case, we go further. Now we have uh, the talk on building language accessibility for the future internet uh, with Heather Bailey, 
director translate house in UK Hampshire. The floor is yours. Hello. Um, my name is Heather Bailey. Um, I'm a director of Translate House. Um, as an organisation, we have been working in the field of localisation for nearly 20 years now. In the beginning, our motivation for translating software was based out of the frustration and that you shouldn't have to speak English before you can use a computer. Um, all of life carries on um, without uh, having to speak English. Um, and a computer is just like another tool, like a spade or a pen, um, that should be able to adapt. Um, so for the same reason, um, this is why we always chose to work in open source software. Um, it's because over the years we found that we were then able to make changes without waiting for permission or for somebody else to do it for us. Charge box and help. So it all started in 2001 when we started a project in South Africa and to create a fully functioning uh, working desktop in all of South Africa's 11 languages. And one of, the, one of my great successes was on the day that we announced uh, that we had um, translated Open Office into all of 11 languages, the first release went out, and the very next day. Microsoft came back uh, with an article to say that they were also um, going to be doing Microsoft's Office Suite in South Africa's languages. So we realized that we were quite powerful in terms of changing um, the way um, vendors, software vendors then started to um, have to catch up. And so then the South African languages became more important on the radar and people started to pay for translations to be done. Um, so at the time, um, and the, this slide is just a picture of the different universities that we were collaborating with at the time, um, but there were many other um, projects in Africa, across Africa, that started to reach out to us at the time um, as, with various different um, issues that needed addressing. Um, and we had the great privilege of being able to set up that unlock network, which is a network of African localizers. And within that team, there was a collection of fantastic skills. Um, and we managed to work on skill checkers across many Southern African languages. And we worked on, uh, we submitted tons of characters to Unicode. And we launched new languages onto the internet, worked on locales. Um, Um, and, and these guys have gone there, and um, keyboard layouts. We managed to connect with many of the software developers and collaborated with them uh, to integrate Kutal, which was the translation management system that we were developing. Um, so some of the major pro projects that you might recognize were um, OpenOffice, Mozilla Firefox, Evernote, Yelp, Skyscanner, and um, now many of those uh, companies are still and using fully functioning uh, virtual servers. So this has um, uh, you know, enabled so many languages to be able to translate those, so those softwares and to be able to use them. So we still maintain the original goals, is that if we see a problem, we will try and fix it, and we will always try and be as practical and scalable to as many languages as possible. So I don't need to tell you how much the landscape has changed over the last 15 years. Uh, many of the things that we tackled in those early years are now well solved or solvable. Um, Unicode, as we just heard, um, CLDR has done a great job with locales. Fonts are less of a problem than they used to be. Mobile is big. It's much bigger than when we started. And um, in some ways, it's locked down. And it's not as open as the free and open software desktop that we started with. Um, and in some ways, we have regressed. 
Um, and the internet, sadly, is not a free space. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, some of these platforms are the internet to some people. Um, so we've handed over the power for them to dictate the terms, the languages that are available for us to use. Localization tools are more widely available and they're related to choose from toolkits. Um, more easily localized for and software is easy to develop and it's ready for localization. So our focus on the internet now is in two areas. Um, and obviously they're not immediately internet focused um, because we keep asking the question if there are less barriers for local languages to engage with the internet, why are people still defaulting back to working in only a few major languages? So our two areas of focus now are one, to influence developers, and to influence content. So on the developer front, we're working um, as part of a project with the EU. It's called the Next Generation Internet. Um, it's uh, aimed to encourage new software projects that are being added to the internet in Europe to have a language strategy um, and a process in place for localization. Um, and once you've opened the door to multiple languages, it does benefit all of the languages, not just the EU. So our focus is to help developers produce the best localization ready software based on the principle, do it well from the start, and keep it open so that you don't burn all your resources. So the next um, one really is, is my passion, and that is books. Um, and this is what motivates me. Um, uh, and, you know, actually paper books, um, books on the internet, yes, but, but books that you can feel and you can read. Um, and why books? Because storytelling is a very important uh, part of preserving and building good language and culture. Stories emerge where people cross culture and um, our social economics. People are fascinated um, and aspire to change and improve. And typically, um, and you know, I have friends in the UK who are from Africa. I have a good friend from Zimbabwe. She's a classic example of an African living in Europe. And we all love the advantages of living um, in a great English education. But it doesn't have to be at the expense of their own home language. She's now connected, has resources, and she is able to be one of the biggest contributors to the Shona language. Um, she is the biggest ally, or can be a really great ally for her language. And books represent uh, what is available on the internet. Um, if we can't create then we'll always be followers who consume, and we become powerless then to accept what it has fed to us. So what are the gifts of the internet age? Uh, we have all these expats who um, have a wealth of local knowledge, and they're able and resourced, um, and we're all mobile now. Um, we can pivot off languages, so some of the dominant regional languages they can allow us to branch out and translate around. Um, these books that we talk about, um, we are uh, this digital books, but print on demand is becoming much more um, an easy way to print books. I just printed off uh, a couple of books that we've done. This was uh, my first 100 book, my first 100 words, and this is the Shona edition. Uh, so if you wanted to see the quality of the books uh, that are print on demand, you never have to keep stock of books. Um, and it's an easy way then to distribute because there's printing centres all over the world. Um, so at the moment what we are doing is uh, uh, we've got close to 250 books published on Amazon. Some of them are written myself, some have other people have written. Um, most of them are public domain works. Uh, that we've captured, we've illustrated, translated. Um, and these are two that I have here, if anybody's interested in looking at them. There are millions of great stories out there um, that are already being captured. Uh, yeah, so we, we, can, we have some resources and we, we can put it from here. And this is the future for me. Um, it's to, to preserve and to keep and to encourage in the arts and in creativity, and to give people the skills and the tools to be able to do that. Um, I'd like to quote Nelson Mandela, 
because he's my hero. It's in our hands to create a better world for everyone in it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Heather, for being so respectful to the time. <laughs> uh, now, uh, while our speaker that is going to intervene remotely prepare his uh, intervention, uh, I will pass the floor to those who have questions to Heather. Any question regarding the topic? on building language accessibility for future internet, which includes also software localization. No questions? Ah, over. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you по-русски задал вопрос. Вот, нет, существуют языковые ресурсы без, безписменные. Безписменные. Они, они сейчас тоже пользуются интернетом. И как бы они создают свой алфавит, вот, походя в интернете, они сами создают как бы свой алфавит и общаются. Что вы думаете по поводу будущего? Вот, Надо, надо заниматься значит, разработкой букварей, э, других значит, материалов для этих э, групп людей, или пусть они сами вот, э, через интернет общаются и, и дальше идти. As agreed, now we collect the questions, but the replies will be later. Uh, I give the floor to um, Mr. Gordon, please. Uh, Two issues. 
Number one, what to do to preserve these languages, under preserved languages, and what and applying this to India, what is happening in India, and what is the uh, role of the new education policy in India, and how we have we have, what we have to do and what we are doing to preserve indigenous languages of India. Let us first see what is the uh, impact of the globalization and the digital technologies on the society in general and on the languages. As all of us agree that globalization has brought homogeneity versus heterogeneity in all respects. So the social uh, values, the social interaction, the social spaces are being slowly replaced by individual interactions, <coughs> individual spaces, and, 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 and the trend is going towards homogeneity instead of heterogeneity. We all talk about the diversity in all its aspects because as linguists, as social scientists, all of us know that uh, bio linguistic diversity, cultural diversity is as important as biodiversity. <coughs> if linguistic or cultural diversity dies, then society will die. If biodiversity will, will, will be suffered, will die, then nature will suffer, it will have an impact on the society. So in both the ways, as all of us agree, that both the diversities, cultural, linguistic, and biodiversities are very important. So what's happening is that this homogeneity is actually leading to the homogeneity of linguistic spaces in the sense that language endangerment is happening. So if we want to know really the reason for language endangerment, it lies in the fact that the homogeneity, the overall trend in the society, it is not only concerned in the languages, it is a social trend, it is a social phenomenon, which is now uh, going in a, in a, which is growing and, and growing in a rapid way, uh, is, is affecting all, all uh, aspects, all angles, all domains of the society, including the linguistic domain. So finally what happens is that once the languages are also going towards the social, uh, the hom homogeneity, homogenization, then automatically with the language, the culture base, the knowledge base. Because, because, why culture knowledge base? Because of the fact that, that any knowledge in the form of its culture is being registered, transmitted, transformed through language. And that knowledge lives only in the communication. When the knowledge is being transferred from one generation to another generation, whether it is the oral form or the written form, the knowledge is alive. It is alive. Otherwise, it dies. And as we know, each community, by interacting for its socio-economic needs with the nature, acquires knowledge. So in that sense, the knowledge of the each and every community is unique. It is unique knowledge because the geographical conditions of the world, yeah, although they are universal, they are individual, they are specific. We know philosophic categories, universal, individual, specific. So the geographical conditions, though they are universal, they are unique, they are specific. So this unique, universal knowledge is there everywhere. Okay? But unique and specific is going to disappear with the disappearance, with the uh, with, with the language, uh, with the extension of languages. This threat is actually to the traditional, so traditional societies, I mean to say uh, indigenous societies or underpreserved societies. So, what to do for that? So, 
can, can the digital technology help us? Yeah, in one sense, I think, this is my personal opinion, that digital technologies will definitely help us. But at the same time, digital technologies is not all, everything. Okay? Because using the technology is not new to the society. When UNESCO, uh, anyone says that the, our society is knowledge society, we are going to build, we are going to build knowledge society, we are going to build information society, it is absurd. Because all the time, in the ancient times also, societies were knowledgeable, societies were, societies were uh, information societies. If they are not knowledgeable, we are not here today. Okay? So, what we are doing is we are continuing it. But whether we are continuing it in the right direction or not, that we have to discuss. Okay? So, what to do? To, to, to protect these languages, uh, indigenous languages. Use of digital technologies like internet charts in indigenous languages, web pages, online learning indigenous languages would be able to protect and develop these languages. And also indigenous language, indigenous communities have to be educated to cross the digital divide. This also sometimes looks a paradox because when the indigenous people are really, they have to be educated to, to, to cross the digital level. It is not always, it is not always. Because, as we know, indigenous people, indigenous communities, they are self-sustained and they are sustainable. But who, who are not sustainable? We are not sustainable, so are modern societies. That's why we are not talking about the sustainable level. Why we are talking now sustainable development? Because something was not unsustainable in our development. That's why we want to go for sustainability. Whereas indigenous communities are sustainable, they are self-sufficient, they, they have a comprehensive approach towards everything, towards understanding of the nature, towards understanding of the society, towards understand, towards forming of the knowledge itself. We are not that. So that's why we are talking about the unsustainability. Okay. However, digital technologies, as I said, digital technologies cannot address all the issues related to the protection and the promotion of the indigenous languages. Because as a social as social linguist, we know that we have language planning and language modernization. Okay? So as a social linguist, we know that language is being used in the society, in its different domains, in its different social forms. One of the social forms is using of technology. It is only one of the social forms. We cannot declare that only the digital technologies will help to protect and promote for that matter, not only indigenous languages, any language. So, as we know as social linguists, that language has to be used in all its social domains. Wherever the language is not used in one or the other social domain, another language, whether maybe English or local dominant language, will take its place, and this language will automatically remove from, the, from its social domain. So, very important factor is that, although we are all here discussing on how to represent the languages in cyberspace, but at the same time, we should be very conscious about that only representation of languages in the cyberspace only cannot protect the language. It may be one of the forms because using of technology in the languages, using of technology is not a new thing. It is not also a new thing. When radio was there, we have used it. When typewriter was there, we have used it. Okay? The writing system itself is a technology. So, our forefathers have invented writing system as a technology. To Register knowledge. Okay, so invention of technology or uh, application of technology to the language. Technology is not a new, so we need not have to worry about it. Okay, let me say uh, indigenous cultures, knowledge are uh, basically rely on oral tradition. So here we have to work out for oral technologies or uh, OCRs, what we say. 
to protect these languages. Coming to the Indian languages, a couple of years back I made a presentation here how languages, especially Indian languages, are contributing to the GDP of the Indian society. Now, just I would like to prove, this is another aspect of proving that indigenous languages are being actively used, I mean to say Indian languages are being actively used in the internet. For example, if you take the internet user basis, in 2011 it was English versus Indian languages 68 to 42, 42 million. Now, in 2016 it is 175 to 234. There is a drastic increase in the use of Indian languages. By 2021 it is predicted that 199 versus 536 million people are going to use the uh, digital listing. Like that, internet services in different Indian languages, it is increasing day by day. Okay? Then the data suggests the popularity, growing popularity and attitude of speakers of these languages in the, uh, to use their mother tongue. Okay? Yes. Okay, like that, if you take urban versus rural users of internet, it is also drastically increasing. So what, what it says that, for example, it is calculated that internet users in Indian language rural areas have higher engagement levels, 530 minutes per week, than urban counterparts, 487 minutes per week. So what all this shows, shows that the, there is an increase in the use of Indian languages uh, on the internet as against to English. Like that, Indian languages are being used in different services. We are not using English at all. For example, if I, if I want a birth certificate for my son, I can use Telugu language and get, on the internet and get a birth certificate. Okay. Now, yeah. So, with this aim, what we have done is that recently we have formed, we took an initiative to preserve and protect uh, in the indigenous Indian language, under preserved indigenous languages. So for that we have formed a consortium recently and the, this consortium uh, objectives are to do this, to promote research and capacity building in order to preserve Indian languages and heritage, to provide a common platform for all stakeholders to undertake outreach and to share knowledge. So in conclusion, I would like to say that extensive communication in Indian languages through digital technology is growing rapidly. This disproves dominating view that English has to be promoted aggressively in all domains of society because new education policy, the government of India and the state governments, they are now promoting English as if it is the only solution for us to make our people educated and civilized. Okay. The designing and development of e-content in vernacular Indian language will contribute to educate massively the unreached populations in the country. It is the one of the recommendations of the UNESCO. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, questions to the speaker about the topic, uh, do you need to come? Language in the digital age. Any, any question? Uh, since no other raised hand, uh, yeah, yeah. So. Someone is back. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for an interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering about the, uh, the interesting link between the indigenous users and the growth in GDP. And I, I'm really curious about this, whether you know, we, we can look at the first wave, let's call it, of just the growth in, in the number of users, number of web pages, but maybe on the second wave, we might see higher e-commerce, for example, or better usage of resources due to the implementation of digital technologies with those communities. I'm, I'm just wondering whether you have research on that. Thank you, Gavit. 
Uh, now we have a remote uh, speaker uh, talking to us from uh, uh, Melbourne, uh, Australia, and uh, we have the pleasure to announce uh, the talk at cyberspace and the preservation of indigenous languages and minority languages with David Bradley, who is President Permanent International Committee of Linguistics, Professor uh, Latrobe University, uh, Melbourne, Australia. Let's hope that the technology will not be so insubordinate. <laughs> So, welcome um, from Australia. I hope you can hear me. Can, you, can someone wave their hand if you can hear me? Thank you. I'd like to thank Professor Kuzmin for organizing this important meeting. And also I'd like to congratulate him and his colleagues for their excellent arrangements. And I wish them all the best for their future endeavors concerning language in cyberspace, and in particular, language atlas work in cyberspace. So could I have my um, second slide, please? I hope you can now see a slide that says, why is policy not needed? Sorry, why is policy needed? Yes? There we go. No? OK, why is policy not enough? Well, firstly, this is the, this is the, first, this is the third slide. Firstly, in the modern world, a relatively small number of languages dominates everything. And this is endangering 90% of the world's languages. So because these languages are marginalized, even in their own traditional territories, and even though they have sometimes been given special rights, they do not um, always lead to the maintenance of their languages and cultures. So we need supportive policy as a first step to counter this trend. Next slide, please. Why is policy not enough? Of course, policy is good, but we also need implementation and incentives for the policies to work, for multilingualism to be maintained, and for other aspects of traditional culture to be maintained. This may require changing attitudes, both within the group, the minority and indigenous group, and among the dominant elite. Just one small example of the value of traditional cultural knowledge is the most effective, the only really effective current anti-malarial, artemisinol, which is a traditional herbal medicine of some minority groups in southwestern China, such as the Lisu. Without this indigenous knowledge, there would be no effective treatment for strains of malaria resistant to other drugs. Next slide, please. This is a picture of Artemisia annua, which is the basis for artemisinol. And as I say, this is a traditional Lisu anti-malarial medicine. So we have to keep this cultural knowledge, otherwise the world will be in grave danger in the future. Next slide, please. So how can cyberspace help to support multilingualism? Unfortunately, most of the content in cyberspace now is in international and major national languages. This is because the content creators are from the elite who assume that everyone should shift to these dominant languages, especially English. But cyberspace is an open medium which can disseminate content in any language. So members of indigenous and minority groups must be encouraged, assisted, and supported to generate appropriate content for the maintenance of their language and cultures, to assist their fellow speakers to access information, and to feel positive about their identity and the value of their language and culture. Next slide, please. Now, I apologize for quoting, quoting Lenin. What is to be done? We as linguists should not only document indigenous and minority languages, we should also make our materials widely available via a variety of internet and suitable print and other platforms in accessible and useful forms. We need to work with print convince people about the ongoing cognitive and social advantages of multilingualism, including in the language of a small indigenous or minority group, and attempt to improve attitudes about these languages. We also need to train insiders who can act as catalysts to reverse incipient language shift 
and create the most valuable insight and other types of content. These individuals need government support, but school education is not enough. The language needs to live in the community and be transmitted from parents or grandparents, as it often is necessary now, to children. Next slide, please. Now, I know that you have a language math project, and I certainly hope that this will be a great success and that it can be something which all of us internationally can both cooperate in creating and also use in the future. The language map provides recognition and empowerment to groups, which can show both their traditional and their current locations, and it provides valuable information for officials and other purposes. Language maps need to represent the current linguistic reality as we find it. Unfortunately, past, effort, past linguistic atlas efforts, such as the print and web UNESCO Atlas of Languages in Danger, the print-only Routledge Atlas of the World's Languages, the web-only Ethnologues, and the LCAT project at the University of Hawaii, and so on, uh, have some problems. These different projects use different standards and often conflicting data. These maps have major problems, all, are all out of date, and where internet from input from cyberspace is possible, this is not consistently used and not well moderated when it is used. With some atlases, there are also major access issues. Ethnologue, for example, is currently behind a paywall in most countries. We need to do better, and I'm sure you will. When we want to map languages, next slide, please. Maps start from the assumption that languages are in a traditional territory which can be clearly and exactly mapped. This ignores what we know of human history, which is a long series of migrations, contacts, and blends. Recent history has also led to very substantial further migrations over very long distances with a distribution of languages which is very difficult to map. Non-indigenous groups have also moved to the traditional territory of many indigenous groups. Now this raises a question. How long does a group need to be in a territory, in an area, to count as indigenous? Next slide, please. Now, I'll be talking about two case studies. One is the Lisu community that we've been working with for more than 20 years in a number of countries. They live in four countries in Asia. They're recognized as official minorities and nationalities, ethnic groups in all four of these countries. We know that in all of the places where they live now, they came from somewhere else. So those in Burma came from northeastern uh, Northwestern Yunnan in China in about 1820s and moved into Thailand in 1919. Those in northern Burma came from the same area of northwestern China of Yunnan in about 1880 and moved into India about 1942. And since the 1980s, a number of Christian Lisu have moved to a number of Western countries. Next slide, please. Now, where the Lisu came from appears to me to be not where they are most widely concentrated now. They moved into this area in northwestern Yunnan in about the 16th century AD, about 500 years ago. The traditional history of the Lisu indicates that they came from what is now western central Yunnan to the northeast of the Nan Chao Kingdom, about 700 AD. The Lisu now speak a language which has two closely related languages, one in uh, northeast Binchuan County, Babu, and another south of the Jinsha, the western end of the Yangtze River, in uh, northern central Yunnan, the Lipo. Next slide, please. There are some small groups of Lisu in Dechang, Yandi, and Kweili, and Kweidok, Kapti, and also in Ninglang and Huaping counties of north central Yunnan. Um, these Lisu, the eastern Lisu, speak a variety which is not easily intelligible to the rest of the Lisu, but it's still quite, quite close to the Lisu. So this again raises our normal issue of what is a dialect, where do we draw the boundaries, how do we distinguish between dialects and languages on the language atlas. Next slide, please. In addition to, next slide. It, uh, okay, that's two slides on. Uh, so let me skip a, one slide. I've um, got to stop while thinking. We have a, a, a group of people who are now Lisu. We used to be members of the Bai, 
and they have been, been assimilated into the Lisu nationality over the last couple of hundred years. Some of the people who are I still speak this Western, Northwestern variety of I, but most of them now speak Lisu and regard themselves as Lisu and are members of a clan called Lama in Lisu. So their Lisu clan name reflects their original I uh, national language, but not uh, their language. Their language is now Lisu. Next slide, please. In the area that the Lisa moved into about 500 years ago in southern Fugal County in Nam, they have completely assimilated another ethnic group, the Anung group, who are members of the Du nationality. Uh, there are only a few very old people who still speak this Anung language. Um, next, slide, next slide, please. The Northern Lisu, the people who are, who are now recognized as Lisu in this area, live in and there is a formerly populated by the unknown. Their women wear clothing that is identical to the traditional clothing of the unknown, suggesting that most of the wives of the Lisu men who arrived uh, 400 or 500 years ago in this area were unknown. Lisu women elsewhere wear completely different clothing. Lisu also has some lexical material and other things from culture and the language of the unknown. And I'll skip a little bit here. Next slide, please. Um, Anong three. Some Anong in northern Burma still speak Anong, but all Anong in Burma now speak Lisu. So they're being assimilated into the Lisu too. Even though these Anong in Burma are officially classified as part of the Rwang ethnic group, they don't speak that language. Uh, the leaders want to be a separate ethnic group and have created an Anung orthography and literacy teaching materials, whereas other Anung now identify as Lisu. So here we have another major issue for mapping languages. Some people choose to generate new ethnic groups which recognize linguistic differences that exist, but which are not officially recognized. Next slide, please. In Thailand, and I'll go through this very briefly, when the Thai um, Territory was first entered by the Lisu in 1919. They had no Lisu women, so they married local Lahu women. And even now, many Lahu uh, women live in Lisu villages with Lisu husbands. In addition, after 1950, when the Omitam was chased out of China by the People's Liberation Army, the Kuomintang um, armies married Lisu women moved into Lisu villages and have now become Lisu. So the Lisu are good at assimilating groups. So three or four generations later, these Chinese patrilineal groups are now just normal Lisu class. They speak Lisu, they view themselves as Lisu, and they have no uh, particular connection with uh, China anymore. So this next slide, please, raises the issue of where are the Lisu indigenous? They're not indigenous historically in any of the places where they now live, even though they are politically recognized as being indigenous to all of those group areas. They're also widely scattered with and intermarried with other ethnic groups. So is a Lisu village that has 40% of the women of um, Lahu or 40% of the men Chinese Lisu village? Well, I think. How do we map them? Do we map them as Lisa? Okay, next slide, please. Um, I have a, note, a main specialization in looking at the issue of language endangerment and how we should react to it. Um, few cyber atlases have done an adequate job with endangered languages. But most are uneven. Most don't have good coverage in many parts of the world. Um, the UNESCO Atlas of Languages in Danger, third edition, probably the most comprehensive. The SIO Ethnologue um, has its problems, and the Hawaii LCAP project uh, also has its problems because it was not uh, adequately funded. Next, please. No, three minutes. Now, I have um, a fairly long excursus here on an, an endangered language, which I will mostly skip. But the Bisu are a small group who live in three countries, 
as you can see from this transparency in Thailand, Burma, and China, they are classified as uh, three different languages in the ethnologue, even though they're completely mutually intelligible and almost identical. The population is small, uh, but we have put them back in contact in the last 20 years. They started to uh, marry each other because it's hard to find a wife within a group of 500 people or 600 people that isn't related to. So it's good that they now have these other bhikshu that they can marry. Next slide, please. The orthographies that I created for the bhikshu in Thailand are based on Thai script and is therefore not suitable for use in Burma or China. The bhikshu in Burma have developed their own romanization based on the Lahu script. Um, the bhikshu in China don't have a script at all. So creating, creating orthographies can sometimes divide groups, unfortunately. Next transparency, please. When we want to map a language, what do we do? OK, do we map the six villages where we know the Bisu now live? Do we map the other villages where we know they used to live? Do we map the places where Bisu women or men have moved out and live in other villages nearby? Do we map the place where Bees who have migrated to, for example, the bees who community in Bangkok. Uh, these people still speak bees to each other, even using mobile phone. Next transparency, please. The bees again, we know that they don't come from where they are now. The bees in Thailand came in about 1850. Uh, the bees in China uh, probably came from what is now the Bisu area of Burma, about 1870. Um, do we map the current situation? Do we map the traditional situation pre-1850? Or what do we map? Next transparency, please. And this is my uh, last transparency. In my opinion, the only way to achieve a comprehensive atlas coverage of endangered languages, or of languages in general, is to combine detailed sociolinguistic discussion of each language with maps showing both traditional and current distribution. This can only be done adequately by directly accessing the knowledge of experts and community members from each language group. It will also require very clear and consistent guidelines and criteria for inclusion of ethnic group member non-speakers, of Tamil speakers, migrants, and so on. Most of the non-digital atmospheres that have been produced in the last past can also provide valuable information uh, and if I could have my last slide, which is just the references, really. The conclusion, the next slide. Last slide, please. Thank you. So these atlases are all good as far as they go for their time. Um, in every single one of them, I was a major participant in creating them. And I think you in Russia oh, can do better. So thank you very much. And I'll stop here. I hope you can thank you very much. So uh, now I pass the floor to those who have any questions. I think that they probably can keep online for a few minutes. Uh, is there any question from the floor to uh, David Bradley? I don't see any, any questions. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, there are some uh, little changes here in the program. Number one, we have a sort of uh, more speakers than chairs. We have a sort of overflow of speakers. So, I'm pleased to invite to the floor uh, the speakers. Um, uh, Anatoly Zosikov, I think, if I am, because our colleagues from France very diplomatically they left here the place for Anatoly, and also uh, Mrs. Um, Izvetlana Zokikov, I think, uh, who could come here also, uh, and he is going to speak. And there is a third uh, speaker. Yeah, uh, uh, stop, please. Uh, hold on, please. There is a third speaker. 
in the same session with his Mrs. Uh, uh, Olga Timofeva Tereshkina, I hope I am not uh, misspelling the name. Uh, in addition to that, um, we have some chairs here in the left side. So during the reply, perhaps uh, Chantal and Luis could also come here for the, the, uh, in the reply session. There is also uh, an announcement from the organizers uh, of the conference. Uh, uh, Anastasia asked me to announce that after the conference, uh, the gathering place for excursions is the parking lot of the House of the Government. It's a building number two from Kirov Street. There will, there will be, uh, the group, will, uh, the, the, the guests will be divided into uh, four groups. Uh, so if the end of the session is there any doubt, we can talk to Anastasia. She will going to guide us for the next uh, activity. So uh, having said that, I will change a little bit the order now. We uh, will have exposition. Ah, in addition, we have also uh, an additional speaker who uh, is uh, Mrs. Uh, Denis Bayraktar. I hope that I'm spelling okay. She is invited also to come here to speak uh, later on. So, uh, I would ask therefore uh, Professor uh, Anatoly Zosikov, uh, who is going to address the, the topic um, uh, www.articmegapedia.ru multilingual portal, current state and prospects for uh, development. You have the forces. Добрый день, уважаемые участники конференции. Я представляю вот коллективный доклад, который буду я представлять один, про арктический ночной различный портал, который реализуется вот в рамках проекта сохранения и развития языков и культур коренных возрастов Севера на цифровых носителях гиперпространства, о, который реализует по программе развития Северо-Восточного федерального университета. Ну, все мы живем в век глобализации и развития информационного общества. И вот мы наряду с нашей реальной жизнью, рядом с нами в сети интернет формируется новая поликультурная среда, в которой сейчас больше очень много общения и очень много информации начинает передаваться с помощью новых технологий. Естественно, что любая, любой язык, любой народ должен быть представлен в этой глобальной сети, чтобы меня в статус стороне прогресса и сохранить свою национальную идентичность. Ну, глобальная сеть интернет, с одной стороны, в рамках сохранения языкового значит, наследия имеет двоякие функции. Во-первых, как средство глобализации, оно помогает вот, доминирующим языкам уничтожать элементарные языки. То есть это средство глобализации, которое может привести к тому, что могут остаться только доминирующие языки. А второе свойство значит, сети интернет в том, что она дает беспрецедентные возможности для малочисленных народов значит, представить свою, независимо от большой или малой, свою культуру, свой язык вот, в глобальной сети интернет. Поэтому значит, необходимо представлять э, все языки в глобальной сети интернет. Э, значит, я представляю кафедру ЕНЕЦКО адаптации общества и человека в арктических регионах в условиях изменения климата и глобализации. И вот э, в 2011 году мы начали реализовывать этот проект. 
Первым народом, которым мы начали сохранять, это стали Люкакиры, поскольку их осталось очень мало, самый малочисленный народ в нашей республике. И Люкакиры, они делятся на тундренных и лесных, и вот из лесных Люкакиров осталось только два-три несколько носителей. Поэтому в первую очередь делись за этот народ и э, начали значит, записывать и сохранять культуру значит, этого народа. Я более подробно сейчас все расскажу. Потом уже э, 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 Венов, Эленков, Болгарий, Чукчи, которые проживают в нашей республике. Но поскольку наш университет является Северо-Восточным федеральным университетом, и в зону ответственности входит весь э, Северо-Восток, э, Дальнего Востока, мы начали организовать проект и на Дальний Восток. Организовали экспедиции на Чехотку, Камчатцу и Хабаровский край. И в 2013 году представили проект на интернет-конкурсе и стали значит, дипломатом номинации с тех, как лучший некоммерческий проект Дальнего Востока. Ну, мы работаем совместно с Институтом гуманитарных исследований и проблема Латинского Севера и Ассоциации КВНС нашей республики. В дальнейшем вот портал приобрел вот такой вид, который вы видите на слайде. Здесь значит, вот, видны все значки всех коренных народов, которых мы вводим на наш мегапортал. Сейчас представлены 28 коренных Латинского Севера. Но, конечно, информация не совсем полная, мы хотим, чтобы все регионы участвовали и как бы, совместно этот проект организовывали, чтобы, поскольку среда питания, образ жизни коренной молитвы похож, поэтому вот, обмен информации на едином портале был бы это очень, с нашей точки зрения, очень актуально. Вот на, на портале есть карта, где компактно проживает коренные молодости народа Севера Российской Федерации. Выбрав вот, э, любой народ на карте, мы можем войти значит, на страничку и получить информацию по каждому народу. Например, вот первая страничка Юкакиры, о которой я вам говорил, значит, вот, э, здесь представлены вот, и известные люди, значит, одежда, жилище, значит, ну, общая информация в целом по Юкакирам, по данному народу. Здесь образ, ну, приготовление пищи и так далее, одежда и многое другое. И самое интересное, что мы взяли за вот самый малочисленный народ, который осталось всего 2-3 носителя, э -э пригласили Демину Людмилу, э Любовь Николаевну Федерану Якутск, ездили в Мелиной тоже, и записали полностью значит, вот, язык, самоучители, значит, делали разговорники, учебные пособия различные по югогирскому языку. И в полной мере всю информацию по югогирам собрали, можно сказать, мы оцифровали полностью югогирский народ. И дело в том, что сейчас э, можно сказать, что э, югогиры пошли на этап ревитализации. То есть сейчас уже э, вот, э, носитель языка стало намного больше. Меньше было, вот, проходили дни югогирской культуры, на котором была видеоконференция, вот, связанная с Нелиным, где проживают компактно мясные юкогиры, с Чешским, где живут э, значит, э, э, тундельные юкогиры, и еще Анабарский луч, по-моему, где тоже изучают вот, юкогирский язык. В целом э, носитель языка стало больше, и язык начинает прогрессировать, молодежь проявляет интерес к этому. Вот. Ну вот сейчас мы увидим Демину Любовь Николаевну, которая э, нам мы услышим живую речь. Можно там кнопочку нажать, а? Мушки. Ой, нет, обратно. Также мы что? Александр, 
Слышно? Так, очень жаль, хотелось тоже показать так, живой язык наших коренных мотивов народного севера. Вот презентация, что у нас было все нормально. Вот. И в целом у нас были экспедиции организованы вот по нашей республике, потом выезжали на Чехотку и Хабаровский край. И в целом ситуация такая, что очень осталось мало носителей языка, которые с каждым днем, у которых становится каждый все меньше и меньше. Вот практически если бы мы не успели записать вот носители кругирского языка, практически эта культура, язык будет пропали совершенно безвозвратно. Поэтому... Так, вот. Хорошо. Вот, Бёрна Львовна, которая... Чего я знаю, что которые практически исчез, но он все-таки же... Можно дальше. Теперь я не могу проводить, да? Так, также вот э, пример странички рынков. Можете посмотреть и можно тоже видео включить. Э, значит, вот мы сейчас рынкистую песню можем прослушать. Это все на портале имеете, да? Так, дальше. Так, вот э, по Хабаровскому краю, когда мы были, значит, э, встречались с нанайцами, записывали на Найску, на Найских э, носителей языка, можно видео. И вот э, Антонина Сергеевна Киле, которая... Вот Хабаровский край, Сейчас я просто, я это сказать. край, в котором живет 8 коренных малочисленных народов севера и Дальнего Востока. Ну, насколько мне известно, вот, это, по сути дела, один из самых немногих территорий, где проживает такое количество этносов коренных. Да, дело в том, что вот, записали на Антонину Киле в июне, а в сентябре ее уже не стало. То есть э, ушла сюда вот, э, как бы, носитель языка, не только, она разработала учебников и так далее, вот, пособий. И вот, э, вот так, такие вот потери у нас идут каждый день, поэтому надо успевать все это дело записывать. Также мы были у негитальцев, значит, э, этот народ э, на, на пленарной секции вот, э, сказал, что осталось всего 6 носителей языка. Это действительно так. Мы приехали в село Владимиров, где компактно проживает около тысячи носителей негитальцев, из которых оказалось, что всего две бабушки знают язык, больше никто языка не знает. У нашего поколения люди не разговаривают на одном языке и говорят, что нет необходимости вообще значит, заниматься этим языком, ну, изучать его. Да? И кроме того, даже вот этих двух бабушек, когда мы кое-как уговорили записаться, национальная одежда, они уже стесняются носить и совершенно не носят, она находится только в доме культуры. И мы уговорили одеть их одежду, которая была в Доме культуры, значит, дети бабушек мы успешно записали. Можно? Да. Вот они. Вот это уникальная запись, потому что больше носителей языка не китайцев в этой деревне нету. Вот все мир. И потом, когда мы заканчивали, значит, закончили запись, прибежали в Луки и пытались, заинтересовались вот в то, что бабушка говорит на том языке. Один мальчик попытался прочитать стихи на негитарском языке, не смог. Потом побежал за друзьями, прибежали друзья, тоже попытались прочитать стих, но забыли. Ну, пообещали, что на следующий приезд они все... Значит, выучат несколько стихов на негитарском языке. Это было очень интересно, и э, как бы, какой-то стимул даже у детей появляется, когда вот такие вот, вот происходят события. Да? Так, кроме того, мы очень 
активно сотрудничать с ассоциацией коммунистов нашей республики, которым нынче удалось через национальную вещательную кампанию записать 200, делать видео, 200 видео лекций по пяти нашим коренным отсюда севера, это по Долганам, Чукчам, Ревенам, Ревенкам и Кургинам. То есть по каждому народу по 40 лекций, уникальные записи, которые вот обучающие по языкам. Значит, и все эти у нас записи размещены, размещены на YouTube-канале нашего портала, на который можно их просмотреть. Дальше. Также у нас есть раздел образования, в котором есть самоучители вот, по лесным кокерам, труды и олимпийские разговоры. Дальше. Вот эти обучающие программы можно там найти. Дальше. Так, вот как пример можно привести сказки по Юкогирам, которые у вас. А на языке и есть, есть перевод. А на Так, кроме того, на портале у нас есть лекции зарубежных лекторов, которые к нам приезжают, читают лекции по адаптации кардинальной народности к изменению климата и значит, промышленное освоение нашей республики по питанию, по здоровью и так далее. Дальше. Вот и тут канал. Дальше. Так. Ну, есть у нас информация по музеям, по культурным центрам, которые занимаются вот, сохранением языкового культурного наследия. Ну и в заключение можно сказать, что э, мы наш портал презентовали не только у нас в республике, на больших российских площадках, например, вот в Санкт-Петербурге в 2017 году мы презентовали на вот, э, Арктика «Настоящее будущее», и там было э, ну, довольно большой резонанс произошел, заинтересовались, и было рекомендовано развивать данный проект как федеральный сетевой проект, чтобы э, все коренные вакцинологи Российской Федерации могли в сетевом варианте с нами сотрудничать и пополнять контент данного портала. Да? И кроме того, значит, в этом году в марте тоже проект был презентован в Сыктывкаре, где был второй международный культурный форум. И в конце мальтийске тоже весной лес портовал вот, вот языков в Российской Федерации. Ну, кроме того, вот нами заинтересовался значит, Северный форум, и мы готовы сейчас готовим проект для того, чтобы представить в Арктический совет чтобы все арктические народы были как бы связаны в единый информационный проект. Все, спасибо за внимание. Before uh, giving the floor to Mr. Francisco Bassini, the next speaker, I, I, would, I would like to know if uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Baikadar is there. If, if she's there, I would invite her to take also this chair, uh, because she's going to address uh, us after the Mr. Francisco Marcinghi's uh, presentation. Uh, we, now we have the topic, the long and tortuous path, path towards the presentation of the, towards the preservation, sorry, preservation of the language and development linguistic diversity in cyberspace with special reference to Africa. Francisco Massini, uh, it's not here, but he's the former uh, president of African Academy of Languages. And now he is honorary professor, uh, Institute for African Renaissance Studies, IARS, University of South Africa, Maputo, Mozambique. You have the floor, sir. Um, good morning. The, the, the 
thing to change the slides. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Mr. Chair, and I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference. Um, as the chair was saying, I used to be in charge of African Academy of Languages. I finished that, I went back to my university where I was before I went to Akalan, which is in South Africa, but I'm originally from Mozambique. Now, what I'm going to do here is very simple, because most colleagues have already raised some of the questions I wanted to raise. Um, it's really a process part towards having our languages um, in a certain space. I am talking here about Africa because that's where I come from and I think that's what I know best. Now, if my memory serves me well, we have been here quite a number of, uh, a, a, a number of times to talk about linguistic diversity in the cyberspace. But if we were to check that cyberspace, we will discover that most languages, particularly the ones from Africa, uh, are not there. Uh, this has been said here a couple of times. Now, the, the big question then is why are not there? So I tried to list some, um, what I call the biggest challenges. Um, so one of the characteristics of the African societies is that they are characterized by diversity. So many languages share the same space. Uh, most of us, there are very few of us from Africa who are not bilingual or multilingual because there are so many languages uh, sharing the same space. But the former colonial languages, which are spoken by the very small minorities, which are confined to the urban areas, this is another dimension of our language, uh, linguistic diversity. And we also have the African languages which are spoken by the vast majority of us, both in the urban and the rural areas. And um, with very few exceptions, I, I say this because there are countries like Tanzania, there are countries like Madagascar that try to push for the use of uh, 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 African languages in all domains of society. So except for these countries, the former colonial languages still dominate uh, um, the socio-economic mainstream. Most African countries are independent now for the last 50 years. 50 years by our standards is a lot of time. If you reach 50 years and you are traditional like myself, you show your family why I won't be there because that's how far you can go. But despite all this, uh, the former colonial language still dominate uh, um, most sectors of our society. Why? Because there are these imperatives of nation building. They say if you use African languages, there are too many uh, to bring about tribalism and that jeopardize the nation building and all that. Yesterday, one of the chairs here, one of the colleagues from Cameroon was speaking, she asked, but which language are going to use? There are too many. So you find that uh, policy makers and decision makers, they always say, if you want to capitalize on African languages, which are spoken by the vast majority of us, then the building of national state will be jeopardized because we will have the encouraging the tribalism and other things. And I don't believe on those things, but that's one of the challenges. So because of that, more often than not, uh, linguistic diversity is seen as uh, a liability rather than an asset. So, I mean, if you speak so many languages, you should be clever, intelligent, one way or another. But that's not appreciated because uh, linguistic diversity is more of a liability than anything else. The other thing which was mentioned by our colleague. Uh, myself from the Central African Republic, when he said, you know, um, 
in the government that would support the development of Sango is because of lack of political will. Uh, there's no political will to support the languages. If you want to hear the African leadership speaking in African languages, come during the elections. There you will hear the most of them are fluent in this language. They go to parliament, if you don't speak a former colonial language, it's no problem. And I call this a subaltern mindset, you know, complex, inferiority complex. So this is really a big problem because we are convinced by ourselves, we have convinced ourselves that um, if you want to be somewhere where we've never been before, you can only do that if you speak the former colonial language. So if you want to be civilized, want to be beautiful, want to be smart, do it in the former colonial language. And this has entrenched the, the, the monopoly and supremacy of these former colonial languages. This is another big challenge. Now, I, I suggest something here, uh, quoting one of the greatest sons of Africa. Uh, I suggest that we need to push. I think I've done the right thing. Yes. We, we need to push the, the, the frontiers of research. What do I mean by this? Uh, this is a way of uh, addressing the challenges I was mentioning. We need to push the frontiers of research. And one Kuma used to say, thought without practice is empty. And the action without thought is blind. So we need to combine the two. Um, so the efforts towards the preservation of languages and development in this diversity in the cyberspace should go beyond academic gathering or conversations. They should go beyond business considerations. Uh, some of us who are here with due respect, I'm not trying to undermine anything. We run companies which want to make money. I like to make money myself. But um, we, we should go beyond that. To include resource mobilization, my friend and dear colleague Benjamin he said he wanted money before he could get data. So our gathering should include also resource mobilization so that we can do the type of work we need to do. We need to have a concrete and implementable plans of action uh, that include capacity building. Our host, um, I always have difficulty in saying his name, but you know, Kuzmini said, did you find any Russian to cooperate with you? I could have asked the same question. Did you find anyone from my language to cooperate with you? Probably the answer is no. Why? Because there's no capacity to do these things. I was thinking of best words in English, English is my fourth language. So there's no uh, technical know-how. You said in English? Yeah. How to do things? We don't know. So these things should include capacity building. I had somebody here whispering, he said, well, you know, these words, um, Camus is a Swahili. Does Benjamin speak Swahili? I said, yes, yes, he speaks fluent Swahili. So we need to include in what we're doing uh, capacity building using the various available platforms. We will make some kind of progress. This is a suggestion to address what I call uh, um, the, the, the major uh, 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 challenges. Now, uh, I, I come with this, you know, we need to harness the power of cooperation. You know, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, we go together. So I think this can help us a lot. We need to cooperate to harness the power of cooperation in order to go far, in order to make sure that all the languages are found in the, in the, in the, cyber, in the cyberspace. Um, I, I put this one by public demand. I don't know it. But somebody came to me and said, can you put it right? This one addresses the issue of subaltern mentality. We sometimes look at the mountain and say, well, we can't climb this mountain because
because it's so big. We are so weak. How can we do it? So the, the African wisdom says, if you think you are too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. So if a mosquito finds a way into a bedroom, even if it's one, you won't sleep. So we need to believe in these things in order to advance and have a real linguistic diversity in cyberspace. I say that we Africans were convinced that development means development means using the former colonial language. I'm suggesting here that we need to extend the meaning of development. What is development? Can you really kill hunger with food cooked in borrowed parts? Uh, Offered maize never fills the granary. You have to produce your own maize to fill the granary. So we Africans have to, at some point, believe that, yes, we need to maize, French, English, and all that. But that's not the end of the world. When I come to your beautiful country called the Russian Federation, or I go to China, I, I get excited, like, right, you know. Uh, a child before a bonbon, because I see things happening around us without any kind of English, Portuguese, or French. It's your own language. This is quite a big encouragement for me. We, in order to do what I'm saying here, to avoid trying to keep hunger with food cooked in color pots, we need to accept some kind of a paradigm shift. Uh, this means that the efforts towards the preservation of languages and the open religious diversity in other states should be seen as part and parcel, particularly in Africa, as part and parcel um, of the search for viable strategies to bring about sustainable development. We are not doing what we do, we don't talk about English diversity because we are English, or because we are clever, or because we are anything like that. But because we want to contribute towards bringing sustainable development, which will change the life of the majority for the better. If we accept this, then we will be where we have never been before. Conclusion. This won't happen overnight. Um, as I was saying, I, I, I'm not saying in Africa, let's throw English away, French away, Portuguese, no. What I'm calling for is some kind of uh, linguistic equity, like we talk about gender equity. Uh, when we came to present here, we put some ties. When we are sitting on that side, we put jeans. It means there could be some kind of level vision when it comes to languages which language in its place. But this won't happen overnight. So I brought certain things here close to home, in French and English. I hope they are the right one. As I said, English my fourth language. So if there are any mistakes, please bear with me. But I, I see my, my colleagues there are nodding their head. Do you think they exist in English? So we need to think that, you know, bit, bit by bit, we can get some, we can make it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before giving the floor to the, le the last speaker, uh, I wish to invite uh, uh, Mr. Anapoli Zosikov to take place here on my left side and uh, to compose the panel. And also maybe uh, 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 Louis Cousin and uh, Chantal Lebrun. Uh, and uh, now we are going to listen to uh, Mrs. Uh, Bayraktar. Bayraktar. Uh, Mrs. Bayraktar, Denise uh, is head of communication and the Information Committee of the Turkish National Commission for UNESCO. 
uh, and she's going to announce her topic. Thank you very much. children are 
taught Turkish and they are taught uh, also different languages, but moreover Turkish. And this is done uh, in a daily basis in shift uh, programs that adults and children are uh, uh, educated. The number, the statistics about the Syrian children in Turkey is now about the percentage of the youth, the Turkish children's percent, percentage. That's a very important number. Uh, and so, um, concerning the Turkish Radio and Television Broadcasting Corporation, uh, we have uh, several channels. TRT Arabi, TRT Kurdi, TRT Awas for Balkan languages, and uh, so uh, other uh, languages like Macedonian, Albanian, Arabic, Persian, Kurdish, and Bahasa, the Indonesian language, and Chinese languages are in the preparation phase uh, for transmission to radio. So, and I want uh, to give the example of an interesting uh, language form, which, is, which has become the uh, UNESCO Intangible uh, culture, cultural heritage uh, kind of acknowledgement in 2017, which is the Whistle language. And the Whistle language uh, was throughout for years uh, a common, uh, not common to us, we didn't know about this, but then uh, uh, two directors made a film on the Whistle language, and now uh, this, this uh, language and this uh, area is kind of become popular and the, uh, the kind of providing support for these uh, people who are using still this non-verbal verbal communication, but at, uh, at the same time it's a uh, language. So um, another important um, um, thing or, or, or uh, attempt is by Anadolu University Open Education Faculty, which I was a part of years ago. And uh, the university is uh, doing uh, Arabic, English, French, and German language uh, courses throughout uh, uh, since 1983 uh, on the websites, uh, in television, and radio programs. OK, uh, I will come back to the uh, issue of the migrants. We have now this three, over 3 million migrants in Turkey. And uh, over 800,000 of these migrants belong to the age group between 15 and 24. And uh, so, as I've said, they are doing education and uh, another uh, kind of cyberspace or uh, mobile phone uh, service is provided by Turkcell, the uh, mobile phone providers. And they have uh, prepared and uh, conceptualized applications for migrants to uh, reach their families to uh, make uh, translation from their own languages to Turkish or other languages, also on their way to, their, to the destination countries. And uh, so, um, as, as in, in general, I would say, uh, in Turkey, Perhaps the approach to language is a bit different than in Russia or the other countries, as it was the, uh, the uh, matter of the speeches since two days. But now uh, we have this, this uh, full, perhaps, um, uh, okay, this, this assignment for us, so to say, uh, with migration and uh, so. Uh, migration is uh, kind of uh, con concerning the language loss or concerning how the language uh, could survive. That's a problem we could uh, think over and over again. Because on the way, the language can be forgotten, the language can be mixed with other uh, languages, as it will be for the uh, future of the Syrian children uh, living in Turkey nowadays. And he thought they would be going to destination countries. No, now the destination countries has become Turkey. So I would like to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. So uh, now we are almost about to finish the session. 
but uh, I open the floor to the to questions to the, third, the the three last speakers to Mr. Um, uh, Anatoly Zikov, to Mr. Francisco Martini, or to Mrs. Um, Bayraktar. Any question to them? Yes. Uh, very interested, especially when you talk about the African situation, and uh, in particular when you say that multilingualism is really a hallmark of Africa. So I'm looking at the political leadership and their indecision, inability, and maybe the fear to categorically face the problem of multilingualism in countries like Zambia and many others where like you said, a foreign language is actually adopted as opposed to an indigenous one. Um, I'm just beginning to think that the post-independence leaders have been afraid of the past, afraid of the present, afraid even of the future that they haven't seen and may not even have the opportunity to live in. So much that when young people who are their heirs to the future create some kind of language, for example, in East Africa, you have Shen, which is not really associated with any difficult parts. So it's young people basically communicating in a language that they all agree, uh, agree on. Again, the same people that have a problem with past, the future, and the present still have a problem with that. So they cannot, for example, uh, think about ways of capacitating the emerging languages. What are your views about what should be done regarding this if there's a problem with uh, the already existing languages that are associated with either colonialism or maybe with uh, ethnicity or some kind. Okay. Any, any other questions to the three last speakers? Yes, yeah. И вопрос к Жужикову Анатолию Васильевичу. Первый, первый вопрос, кто финансирует сайт? И э, есть ли там материалы на всех языках, о которых вы говорили, 28, да, там получается? И э, следите ли вы за посещаемостью сайта? Посещаем. Еще раз, кто финансирует? Окей, okay, спасибо. Uh, so now uh, we are going to address the questions or the comments. On my list, I had a comment from uh, Marcel Dick Kidney that might result in a recommendation to the uh, uh, final document of the conference regarding uh, appropriateness of Unicode to tone language, if I could get, get, get the, 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 the message. Then we have also uh, a question from our colleague here. I do not see his name, but uh, it was obviously to Heather, I think. Uh, then we have a question of uh, Marjorie Gordon, who is not yet in the, in the room, uh, also address to you. And finally, we had a question from Gart uh, uh, Werner, as to uh, Prabhakar how. So, uh, we start with the letter. Uh, to answer your question, um, uh, we're really encouraging supplementary reading. We're not, encouraged, we're not um, uh, saying that we are uh, prescribing a reading program. Um, I, I don't think I need to convince any of you that mother tongue uh, 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 is really important for children when they're little. And um, so to sit with your child with a book on their lap. So what we are trying to do is just to create supplemental reading in languages where there are very little resources. Um, and then the second question was from Dorothy regarding whether these uh, books and the, the translations were we using machine translation or tools. Um, yes, we do. We have an Apollo Brutal server and we are using tools to translate the books. Uh, okay, now it is uh, the And they said that contribution of languages, Indian, is the major Indian languages, it is not meaning these languages. 
the major Indian languages, basing on different parameters. For example, the contribution of uh, languages in the film industry, in the print media, let us say, in the, in the industry, small scale industry, large scale industry, in the government, etc. So, basing on these parameters, we have calculated the contribution of these languages in terms of economics. So, it, 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 it has shown that that uh, the languages also contribute to the economic growth of the society. I strongly believe in it because of the other reason also. Why? Because, you see, in ancient India, there were thousands of languages, there were number of kingdoms. There was no conflict, linguistic or cultural conflict between the kingdoms. There may be some religious conflicts within the Hinduism that itself, maybe. But all languages have flourished like anything. But why the kings have, if we think the other way around, why the kings have who did, did not disturb the flourishing of the languages and cultures, they did not know king has, although he has occupied other kingdom, he did not ever learn any language. Why? Because it might have contributed to the growth of the kingdom. Okay, so that's why the, when we say that the economics of the language is if indigenous languages we cannot count because they are not, we don't know uh, how to do it because their participation in different social domains is limited. Whereas major languages we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have so uh, last question answer to uh, Anatoly Zosikov, please. По поводу финансирования проект 2015 будет финансироваться за счет программы развития северо-восточного федерального университета, а позже уже финансировали нас нет, но мы в таком плане энтузиазма эту работу продолжаем, привлекаем студентов, с которыми выезжают свои европейские места и так далее. Ну, презентую на различных конференциях и так далее. Ну, в принципе, вот насчет ресурсов, действительно, оригинальных ресурсов у нас, конечно, мало, потому что мы основном то, что мы собрали в результате экспедиции, а вот эти основные сайты мы просто наполняем общей информацией для того, чтобы потом привлечь вот те регионы, чтобы они, в принципе, начали наполнять действительно оригинальные содержания. Uh, I think there is also your question to uh, Francisco Martini, uh, please. Italia, um, thank you very much for the question. Um, let's take Zambia, which is your home country. The Zambia of yesterday is not the Zambia of today. Why? Even my own country, where the Portuguese embarked on um, assimilation policy. It's not the same. Why? Because you you can buy your house on credit, you can buy your car on credit, but you can't tell your stomach to, to go on credit. It, it's not serious. The, the, the majority of the people who don't speak the former colonial language are excluded from everything. So at some point they say we have nothing to lose. The politicians have to protect their comfort zone. And myself, they need yourself and us. Because if we don't do anything about the language issue, which is the main cause of exclusion, we will have problems. The African Union came up with Agenda 2063 um, for the benefit of other colleagues. Agenda 2063 is like a blueprint, a roadmap, how to develop Africa, the Africa we want, it comes in pillars. There's pillar number five, which is about culture and languages. As I speak to you, most African countries are endorsing Agenda 2063. They want it to. See, they want to see it implemented because they know there was somewhere uh, there was somebody in Sudan who ran away from his palace. There's somewhere else. So people have nothing to lose because. They have been excluded for so long. So the, the, the conditions, of course, politics, a game of waves, a game of streets, and other things. This is my definition 
don't call me. So uh, they would have tricks and to, to, you know, to, to clinch to power. But the Africa of two years ago, twenty years ago, is not the same. Today, there's more awareness and um, about the language issue than yesterday. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I, when I was working for Ireland, my job was to work with member states on language policies. I went to the 54 countries. All of them were ready to listen. But of course, language is power. Uh, one of the difficulties we have in this country is because we can't read what is hidden in Russia. So those who claim to control the world, they know that if one day you use your language to the full, then we change the terms of power relations. They will go on the periphery and will come to the center. So it, it, it's not easy. It is a, it, I see it as the second struggle, but we need to be ready for it. That's why my last slide was saying that it won't happen today, it won't happen tomorrow. But it's possible to do that because those who have been excluded by the British chair, they have been. For so long, they are not willing to accept that. They, they, they want to be part of what is happening in their country. And because, and today is very interesting because you see, um, when we have independence, the, the freedom fighters, some of them came from where they came from. And they told us a story we didn't know. Take Angola, Mozambique, we never, in Zimbabwe, we never knew what happened in the bush. We only knew what they told us. Just to conclude. But today you elect people, mm -hmm. you know they come from so you are village, they speak your language. So they can't tell you stories which don't exist. Because you say, let me talk to you in my language, you come from my village. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco Mazzini. Uh, before to adjourn uh, the session, I would like uh, to, to thank you all the speakers and also to thank you, the plenary, for the questions. I would make a very short comment, as I did in our morning session. I think that the multilingualism, of course the multilingualism, needs uh, language warriors, but the multilingualism also needs language pacemakers, those people that do the grassroots work that enable language to be present in the cyberspace. We had a good example here with the, the Arctic portal that, that shows that while in difficult uh, obstacles, are poss it's possible to circumvent these obstacles. There is so many uh, work to be done that I would uh, mention the post-war, second war, when the world decided to uh, make an agreement and to create an uh, environment that brought to the creation of UNESCO. And my last words is to uh, uh, make an appeal to continue this uh, effort uh, of information for our program, which is the main uh, uh, component of UNESCO uh, program to promote multilingualism in cyberspace. Having said that, I thank you very much for your cooperation to this section. Thank you.